excited to share God's word with you and get started. We've been growing all summer. Was Stuart Greaves not awesome last Sunday? Was that not amazing? It was fantastic. And a few weeks before that, we had uh, Brad Formsma who uh, shared his book, I Like Giving, uh, along with his son Drew on generosity. And uh, how many of you have been uh, practicing acts of generosity? I know I have. And uh, he sent me a surprise. I didn't know that uh, he found out my shoe size uh, was a 12. And he sent me a pair of, of 12 shoes. And uh, I, I got them uh, in by surprise and looked at them. And I was like, these, these are just awesome. But I didn't feel like they were for me. I can't explain it. I just had that funny feeling. So they sat in my office for a week or two. And last week when Stuart was here, we were back in the office and I said, do you, have, do you, do you wear a size 12? He goes, he goes, yeah. I said, I received a free pair of uh, these great looking shoes. They're more than a hundred bucks, you know, and I think I'm supposed to maybe give these to you. He goes, you are. <laughs> I said, I, I said, I am. He goes, yes. He said, I haven't, I haven't bought uh, shoes for several decades. He said, the Lord always gives me a new pair of shoes when, whenever he's transitioning. It was really cool. So I was like, whew, thank God I obeyed the Lord. Poor fella. <laughs> no. Anyway, that's good. Anyone here starting a new job tomorrow? Anybody starting a new job? Wave at me. Who's starting a new job tomorrow? Just stand up where you're at. Everybody starting a new job tomorrow? Stand where you're at. Just stand. I'm gonna ask a couple of, uh, people to slip over beside them. Oh, the Lord put this on my heart during one of the worship songs as Jordan was singing. I just want to speak a blessing over you. Stretch your hand toward these folks that are starting a new job. In Jesus' name, first of all, God, we thank you for the provision. We thank you for what you're doing. We also thank you, God, that you're up to something new in their life. We pray for fresh ideas. And in Jesus' name, I pray for favor uh, at this new place. I pray they would not walk in worried or concerned about performance, but that they would put their whole heart into serving you in that uh, spot and pleasing you and being the best employee that that place has ever had. Give them incredible ideas and creativity. In the name of Jesus, we bless them. Amen. Let's give God thanks for these new opportunities. Amen. Today, the title of my message is How to Break Free from Insecurity. How to Break Free from Insecurity. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about this topic. I'm going to uh, go a little bit deep into it because I think it can help you both in all your relationships, but definitely can help you on the workplace. It could even help you in raising kids or uh, even in dealing with, uh, with your grandchildren. So I think there are some, some uh, real things in here that can help us deepen us spiritually and cause us to grow, and uh, I hope to kind of be able to help us get to this place where we learn to be securely dependent upon the Lord, that, that that is where we want to be secure. We're not trying to find our security in, you know, who we are, how smart we are, or how much money we have, or how talented or gifted we are, but, but that we find our confidence in the Lord. How many know there's nothing better than when you meet somebody that they're just confident in who they are and who God's made them to be? They're a wonderful person to be around. They add to the room. They have energy in the room. But then you can also be in the room with somebody who acts the same way, but it kind of doesn't, the spirit doesn't kind of, you know, something feels off. And generally, those are, the, those are the kind of people that are, they're in it for other reasons. They're not in it because the Lord has kind of assigned this task to them or, or this place they're in. They haven't maybe even discovered who they are. And sometimes there's even insecurity in that. So uh, I'm, today what I'm not talking about is kind of like fake it till you make it, show some personal confidence. That's, that's you know, that's for another season, another time, and, and not from this stage. What I'm trying to do is, is to say, look, uh, probably deep inside everybody, if we could see one another, you'd be like, whoo, they're a mess. You're a mess. <laughs> but it's okay to be a mess if you've got Christ right in the middle of your mess, because he somehow can bring a lot of good out of you, even though uh, you have a lot of uncertainty about yourself. So I want to get a couple of facts down uh, right, out the, right out of the gate. God is not wanting to grow you in such a way that you get cocky 
or arrogant or o- over the top where you go, I'm going to stand on my own two feet. Bless God, I'm going to take this matter. Okay, not, that's not what this is. Okay, that's not, that's not even the opposite of, of insecurity. Uh, that's something else altogether, maybe for another time, another message. But I want you to see that in your uh, in the middle of who you are and all of your humanity, in the middle of all that, that God is at work wanting you and inviting you to depend upon him more and more. And in learning that, you should not be swirling around in your own personal insecurities, but realize God made me just the way I am and he is going to empower me and help me and strengthen me and grow me up through this so that I become more and more like him. The truth is God does not want you to be insecure, but rather securely dependent upon him. This is God's goal. God wants you to be securely dependent upon him. That I know that I know that I know. I remember when Darla and I made the first shift over when, when um, in early in our marriage, when it, we were talking about finances and, and concerned about finances and all that. And I just remember when we made the shift and said, wait a minute, we're God's. God's called us. God, God has a vested interest in us, and he will provide for us as long as we acknowledge him in all of our ways. Can you say amen? Now, I know there's a bunch of seniors in here in the deeper part of their life that probably went into the retirement age with no retirement in the bank account, but they're still making it. They're still here, and God's still providing them and giving them his sustenance and his manna for them every day, and God will do the same for you. But there are times when you find yourself overwhelmed with self-doubt, or maybe you feel like those around you uh, are judging you, or, or, or maybe when you look around, you feel like, you know what, there are others around me that, that are better than I am. You know, I, I remember thinking when we were uh, young pastors, this is our very first church, senior pastors, and I remember looking at different couples throughout the auditorium and I would think, and, and they're older, and I would think, oh, you know, they have a good marriage until you've been pastoring six or eight months, and then they come in and tell you, you're like, ooh, had that wrong. And then I realized pretty much after we passed their five and a half years, I was like, ooh, the whole place is messed up. I mean, the people in the room that are following Jesus are following Jesus for a reason. <laughs> okay, y'all are not getting that. You'll get it. You'll get it at some point. Here's a couple of other, uh, other facts. Number one, most people feel insecure sometimes. Almost everybody will feel insecure sometimes. But number two, some people feel insecure. Some people feel insecure most of the time. So I'm talking to both audiences today, but if you feel insecure about who you are or some aspect of you most of the time, I think there's some real um, um, strength and and biblical uh, framework for you to get a hold of to kind of reorient your life so that you can break free from insecurity. You know, everyone has to overcome insecurity in the spiritual realm. Even when we say to be naturally supernatural is to say you are natural, but the the supernatural is infused into you and it's, it's making a difference. Insecurity, though, can be dangerous, and I want to talk to you about that today and show you from the scriptures what I see. It actually can even be devilish that the enemy uses insecurity to keep you from realizing the blessings that God has for you. Think about Abram, who became Abraham. When he sets out on the journey, he sat on the journey. He didn't know where he was going. He's just following the Lord. Kind of feels like a church that's put its property up for sale and now sell. We don't know where we're relocating to, but God does. We're just following him in the same way That could feel insecure, uncertain, but when you are secure in the Lord's voice and secure in what he's saying for you personally, you're growing in that, it adds a security, that natural supernatural part. And the natural supernatural part is, it is a cure for insecurity. It does help, but you you don't just have it because you say the word or because you think the thought. There are some things that go into that. There are three types of insecurity, and I'll just mention them briefly that psychologists have identified. Number one, type number one is insecurity based on recent failures or rejection. Recent failures or rejection. And this would just be like if you're being shunned or ignored. And, and it's one of the hardest things about being a teenager when you're trying to fit in and you go to a new school especially uh, where the kids ignore you or it doesn't seem like you're, you're kind of fitting in or whatever, and you can experience a ton of rejection 
in that way. But the same thing on a new job or, uh, or in other ways. Number two, type number two is feeling judged by others. You just feel their eyes kind of burn in a hole in the back of your neck. It, it creates a social anxiety and sometimes it will even steal the joy out of life. That it creates a fear of always being evaluated by others or uh, you're around people that are always looking to blame somebody for everything. That, that you don't want to get the blame and so you, you pull back and it, uh, uh, it creates a, an insecurity in that way. Uh, type three is this inner security that's driven by perfectionism. And maybe you were raised by a perfectionist parent or somebody that thought every, everything ought to be done perfect. Or maybe that's a standard you have for yourself. I'm going to do everything exactly, uh, exactly right. You know, I'm, I'm going to get the highest grades. I'm going to uh, get the highest paying job. And you have this ambition kind of driving you. I have the best kids or the best marriage or, or whatever. But at the end of the day, sometimes that motivation is coming out of insecurity if you're not careful. So here's a revelation that probably many haven't thought about, and that is at the base of insecurity is fear. Fear is at the very bottom rung of the ladder when it comes to being insecure. If you're insecure, it means that you're, you're, you're fearful you don't measure up. You're fearful that um, your, your husband is going to leave you. You're fearful you're going to lose your job, and so you live your whole life and work your whole career Word, you're going to get fired, that, that fear, that insecurity. And that's kind of what I'm speaking to a little bit this morning even. That feelings of insecurity come directly from feelings. So we have to kind of orient like our frame of mind and our frame of understanding when we think about it. I believe feelings of insecurity for Christians for sure comes from this sense of being disconnected from God. It, in my opinion, it's one of the main ways or one of the main reasons why the enemy of your soul tries to get you to commit sins because in your committing sins, you shy back or pull back from God because you feel bad about what you've done. And the more you pull back and more you pull back, you depend upon your own strength or you're going to make it. Uh, and you end up living outside all the empowerment that God has for you because of the guilt that you feel. We all face insecurity. We will all face it at some point or another. But I think there is a, a, a way that, that we need to maybe uh, understand it a little better. Uh, in between services, it, it occurred to me I had a, a picture on my laptop and I sent it to the booth. I'm not sure if, if you uh, uh, guys up there were able to get up that, that picture. Uh, the stick man drawing, if you happen to have that, you put that up here. But I, I thought I would just kind of roll through some symptoms of insecurity. Uh, symptoms of insecurity start off with suspicious thoughts. If you have suspicious thoughts about uh, others or suspicious thoughts about um, those are around you or whatever. Secondly, you have comparative eyes. You know, the Bible tells us not to compare ourselves to one another, but that seems to me to be the whole essence of social media. I mean, some people do want to stay in touch with their lost uncle from Nebraska, but by and large, everybody is on social media to compare themselves with one another. I'm just giving you my, it's my two cents worth. Uh, third is harsh words, a symptom. Another symptom of insecurity is this lashing out, uh, uh, snapping off, of quick, to, quick to anger. It's because uh, the person has been made to feel insecure or you're, you're poking around an area where, where they don't want you and, and the harsh words come out. Uh, another symptom of, of uh, insecurity won't have all of these, you just will have uh, uh, some of them, but um, would be this idea of just walking around with a broken heart, that you just, there's a sadness, a pervading sadness that, that no one's ever really uh, loved you for who you are or, or whatever and however the enemy would fill in the gaps on that. And, and in many ways, in many ways, th this is so telling of, of the, uh, uh, the American culture in which we live because there's so much of this going on and this is how we end up uh, not accomplishing and, and really kind of partnering together to do something great for God because we're all so wounded when we get together. We just hurt each other's feelings so much we can't ever kind of get past that to the next level. Another one is self-defeating actions that 
uh, another symptom of insecurity, uh, uh, especially those that are going to be addicted to opioids and, and other kinds of addictions that, that go into that. There's just this self-defeating action because they don't believe they deserve to be promoted or don't believe they deserve any uh, higher accomplishment or whatever. And then uh, unwise decisions. You just make choices that you know are bad, but you don't care. It's just this self, um, this, this idea of um, myself doesn't deserve it. It's another symptom of insecurity. And so insecurity is essentially then fear in disguise. That, that's what it is. It's fear in disguise. So I want to talk to you. I want to take you to the, a Bible verse in a second. But I want to talk to you about King David and King Saul. There's probably not a better set of stories in the Bible that illustrated any better than this. I don't know of any. And so the bottom line that, that uh, I know God is up to is that God is wanting humility to be worked in you supernaturally, but it cannot be born out of pride, only brokenness. So I want you to kind of hear me when the devil comes to you and says, look, I don't want you praying, I don't want you worshiping, or you're overwhelmed with that sense. The shift that you want to make in your mind, say, that's the very reason why I should worship. Because I'm not worthy and he is worthy. So he is deserving of all that I can give to him. So thank you for reminding me how unworthy I actually am so that I will give him praise. It's a bizarre, it's a bizarre twist. And, and in many ways, uh, when the enemy comes to you, this would have been like uh, Adam and Eve, even in the garden, the whole thing. The, the, all, of, all of your life, you're going to, to have this, but the Lord is wanting to show you that uh, humility is birthed out of brokenness. Humility is birthed out of not feeling like you're enough. Anybody on that train? Humility is born out of not feeling like you're enough. I mean, we can all do, we can do a positive talk seminar and have you take notes and get you all fired up and rah, rah, rah and go out, but it's somewhere on a Tuesday morning, Without that extra latte, you're going to dip somewhere along the way if you don't know your identity and who you are in Jesus. But when those dips come, if you know who you are, you just can say, oh, geez, I'm in a dip. Okay. You know, the great news about feeling sad is you won't feel that way forever. It will come, it will come and go like weather systems, these these moods will, will float. They, they probably float in your neighborhood. They just move from house to house. It's just like these moods, oh, you know, 3741. They're depressed over there this week. Watch them in the parking lot. Be careful, you know. This guy cut me off in traffic on the way to Starbucks this week. Big old truck, red truck, big old giant mirrors, bigger than my first car. He jumped a curb over on Stratford Road to beat me in line to the Starbucks, only he turned down the wrong driveway, and I ended up in front of him. How cool is that? So what did I do? You know what I did? I felt like sending him a message to the barista because I'm driving away fast. I bought his drink. I said, you know, know what I'm saying? Insecurity ha has, this, has this way, it kind of overwhelms our life and gets us. And King Saul did the same thing. King Saul in, in 1 Samuel 9, and I, I preached on it at length on a Wednesday night. I mean, an hour we went through verse by verse. So I'm going to spare you the details and give you kind of the highlights here. But I've covered this chapter. And then on a Sunday morning, a couple, three or four weeks ago, I hit it a little bit then. So let me give you 1 Samuel 9. You can just listen. I'm going to highlight it for you. In verses 1 through 3, his father, is, uh, the narrator tells us, is very wealthy and sends Saul to look for some donkeys. In verses 5 through 6, Saul can't find the donkeys. Apparently, Saul really never had a lot of wins to his life, and his dad kind of coddled him to try to help him get some wins, but he didn't. He couldn't find them, and so he goes looking for a prophet to help him find his donkeys. Well, in verses 15 through 24, 
he bumps into the prophet. He says to the prophet, hey, we're looking for the prophet. And the prophet says, hey, I'm the prophet. And here's what came in the conversation. The prophet says, the Lord fully, the, the Lord uh, fully intends to use you, Saul, you and your household. And the Lord told me before I met you the other day that you were supposed to be the king of Israel, that you will rescue the people from the Philistines. This is before the David and Goliath story. At the perfect time, as they're having this conversation, worship is getting ready to start and the feast. And so the prophet says to Saul, who was just out looking for donkeys, even though his dad's wealthy and all of this, sends him, he sends him to the banquet and he shows up in the banquet hall and they say, oh, we're so glad you're here. And they set him right at the head table. It was unbelievable. And then the chef comes out bringing the finest steak and sets it before he was just looking for donkeys like, like a few hours earlier. And now the finest choice of cut meat right in front of him, cooked to his perfection, served by the chef himself and seated right beside him as the man of God, Samuel the one who can hear God's voice. And Samuel tells him, all the hopes of Israel are on you, Saul. And Saul hears what's happening. And, and Samuel says, when you leave here, the spirit of God's gonna come on you and you're gonna dance and prophesy. And that's what happened. And the Bible says the spirit of God came on Saul, turned him into a different person, it says. It was amazing. And literally just a couple of days later, when Samuel is going to announce to all of the tribes that Saul has been anointed king, they can't find him. And they inquire of the Lord, where is he? And the Lord says he's in hiding in the luggage. He's in the closet hiding from everybody. And they go get him and bring him out. You're the king. The Bible says he was taller than everybody else, but he had this latent insecurity inside of him. I want to drive home these dangers because you need to know that Saul was supposed to be David. Saul was supposed to accomplish everything that David did. The Bible says that God, God really not only wanted him to win, told him he was going to win and said, I will establish your household forever, just like he ended up doing for David. But Saul couldn't follow through. Saul couldn't do it. So I want to just give you a glimpse of the story. You know, my book, Slings and Stones, I went verse by verse of 1 Samuel 17. And there's a kind of an obscure part to the chapter that most people overlook. And I want you to hear it, but hear it in light of King Saul. Listen, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a bronze coat of metal, weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shadow of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. The narrator saying he had been working out. He was serious. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield and Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? Sarcastically. I am, a Philist, I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. Don't you see? Goliath called Saul out. And you know what Saul did? He hid in his tent just like he hid in the luggage. It's another destiny moment. God wants him to be king. I don't want to be king. Why? Well, I, don't feel like I, I don't feel like I've got the skills to be king. I can't be king. I'm going to hide. Even though he had the choice of stake, all this drama happened around these donkeys, He's supposed to be king. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkeys. It's all connected in there, and Saul can't get it. And now, years later, he is king, reluctantly. And now, the moment where God's like, I'm going to give you the victory, you go ahead and take Goliath down. And he had learned to, to sling a, a, a rock. He could kill a small animals from a distance. We know that because he was a Benjamite. Even as a kid, he would have been using a slingshot, King Saul was. But it never occurred to him because he wasn't submitted to the Lord and he hid in his tent. It's this Saul syndrome, this vicious syndrome that if you're not careful, your insecurity will get you in. It, it starts with a lack of identity. You don't know who you are in Christ. And then it leads to this deep inferiority complex like, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm never good enough. I'm not, uh, I'm not a good wife. I'm not a good worker. I'm not a good this. I'm not a good that. And you, you come up with all this inferiority, which 
which heaps on you and you miss out on opportunities that God has for you. But I found a verse that I thought, the verse that I wanted to show you, which says everything. And before we see the verse, I want to set it up. Because it's the moment when God says, I'm, I, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm out. God chose him, gave him an opportunity. Saul's disobeying, running, doing his own thing, not uh, trusting his own in, uh, instinct rather than God's not submitting himself to the Lord. The Lord's frustrated. The Lord gave him a specific thing to do with the Amalekites. This is how I want you to handle it. He doesn't handle it that way. And the Lord tells Samuel, the prophet, I'm out, I'm done. I'm gonna pick another king. And you might think that's cruel, but I'm gonna tell you why it's not because the king represented God to the people. See, Moses wasn't a king. Abraham wasn't a king. None of the judges were kings. That God had always been close to his people. God had been the king of his people. And now he's designated being king to Saul. And Saul is going the other way and won't obey the word of the Lord. He's not representing God that way. And look at this verse that tells you why I'm preaching the message today. 1 Samuel 15, 17. And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? Look at that. Isn't that a... Isn't that an amazing little line? In other words, everybody knew Saul was insecure. When you have an insecure leader at the top, it all gets wobbly underneath. Everything gets weird. And this is what happened in Saul's case. It says, Samuel says, although you may think little of yourself. In other words, yeah, can I put it in the NIV language for you? You're the flippant king of Israel. Come on, God called you. God anointed you. God came on you, changed you in a different person. Why won't you obey God? And I believe that's what God's saying to all the pastors in America. Why are you afraid of the people going to vote you out? Lead. Lead my people. Lead to a revival. Lead to see people get saved. Preach the word unashamedly and don't be afraid to be unpopular. Do what you're supposed to do. And that's the same thing God has for you on your job. God wants you to so embody him. You're not Billy Graham on your job. If the HR manual says don't talk about religion, it's against God's will for you to talk about religion because you would be disobeying the authorities over you. But it doesn't say that you can't shine in the middle of your trouble. Because when they see you going through something and they can see you getting hit, this and this, and you respond differently, they go, who are you? What's different about you? See, we've confused. We think what we say, so uh -uh, it's this stuff. And do you know why nobody stepped up to take down Goliath? I want you to remember this line. I've been preaching here 12 years, and I'm not going to say something more profound than this. Spirits reproduce spirits. And Saul was chicken, and so was the whole army of Israel. Not one soldier stepped up and said, I don't think he's supposed to be making fun of God. They didn't have the right context of who they were. We, we are the nation of Yahweh, and Goliath is calling out the king representing God. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. And the little boy delivering cheese sandwiches, I'm not making it up from 1 Samuel 17, says, wait, wait a minute, who is this hairy guy up there saying all these threats? David probably didn't even have a whisker on his chin. 12, 13, 14. He went, whoa, 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 I don't think he's supposed to say stuff like that. I don't think he's supposed to call that out. You, you don't need skill. What you need is God. You need God in your life. You're a single mom, and we celebrate you on Mother's Day, but for you also, we ought to be celebrating you on Father's Day too. You've had to wear two hats raising your kids, being the father and the mother, and I want to tell you, it's not impossible. With God, all things are possible, and you are enough. You do not have to be insecure about who God's calling your kids to be because they grew up with one parent. Hear me, they have two parents, you and God. You step together into who you are and find that security in him. 
You may not have all the education, all the learning that you need to be both father and mother, but you have your hand in the hand of the one who knows everything and can give you tips and pointers all through the year and help you get your kids positioned into just the right way. Insecurity and fear both come out of this heart full of pride. And that was Saul. But David was of a different spirit. Dave, Saul's dad believed in him. We know it. He was kind of, you know, going before him and go talk to his teachers because he got a B plus on a paper and tried to get it raised to an A minus. Not David. David's dad didn't even care. One of David's brothers was going to be anointed king. His dad didn't even care enough to invite him. Whoops. <laughs> Actually, it was David was supposed to be king. Didn't see that coming. And the kid delivering cheese sandwiches calls out Goliath and steps into his destiny, the one that was intended for Saul. So, Pastor, you've painted the picture. Let me give you this, one more. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 6. It says, Bitter people spoke against David and talked of stoning him, but David found strength in the Lord. This is much later in his life as he's waiting to be king. He found his strength in the Lord. There is a difference between King Saul who tries to find strength in himself and realizes it's not there and so he's insecure and the little boy who grew up to be king that said, I find my strength in the Lord and even here he strengthens him when all of his friends turn on him. So I'm going to give you six steps, six ways to break free from insecurity. Here we go. Number one, Identify. Identify where the security is impacting your life and your relationships. Identify it. Identify. Check out this verse from Proverbs. It is dangerous to be concerned with what others think of you. I'm telling you, a bunch of y'all are going to get off Facebook after today. I can just feel revival breaking out. Number two, journal. Journal about it. Get in your journal, talk about it, look for the connections, try to put it all together. Oh, when I was in the ninth grade and then the, had this and then Uncle Billy said that and that all put in there and now I got, and I got all this conflagration of stuff in there. And the Holy Spirit will help you. Look at this verse, Isaiah eight thirteen. Do not fear anything except the Lord Almighty. He alone is the Holy One. If you fear him, you need fear nothing else. Number three, pray about it continually. Pray. So identify, journal, third, pray. Pray about it continually. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Number four, focus. Focus your attention on others, on family, on work. Focus your attention away from yourself. So hum humility, when you have true humility, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking uh, less of yourself more often. You're not the center of the world. Let it go. Think of somebody else. Focus on others. Number five, serve. Serve others out of pure motives. Don't serve others to try to get ahead or build a career. Those are taking new jobs tomorrow. Go in there and serve with your whole heart to make that company win, to raise that company to another place. Philippians 2, 3 says this, don't live to make a good impression on others. You live your whole life trying to impress somebody. They're, they're so selfish, they're not even looking at you anyway. My best advice to young golfers when they go out to play golf and you play with a really good golfer is don't get intimidated by how far they may hit the ball or how good of a player they are because generally they're not even noticing you until you're cursing. So don't, don't call attention to yourself. Did you hit a bad shot? Oh, man. Hit another one. You hit another one. It's the same way in life. Stop calling attention to yourself and every little thing going on. Get up. Right? Get up. Find your security in the Lord. Last night, last night, I, I was home by myself at the house, and, and our, our, our little dog, Bendy, this our little Karen Terrier, she just... She was looking out the window and saw a reflection. And it was dark. And she started losing her mind. Now I let her go. I, I let her go. I was by myself. 
And I let her go for a little bit. I let her go 90 seconds, two and a half minutes, whatever, till she got worked up into a big old lather. And I said to her, You're, I was actually going through the message, trying to help God's people and the dog's going crazy. <laughs> so I, I got up and I went over there and I, 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 I let her out. I turned the light on outside. Turn the light on, <laughs> open the door. And I walked out there with her, stood on the steps of the back patio. She starts running up the hill. We have a fenced in yard. She starts running up the hill. And she gets about 10 feet, maybe 15 feet. And then she turns around like, aren't you coming? <laughs> she looks back at me and I went like this. I went, go ahead. Arr! She turned around. She ran all the way to the corner of the fence, ran down the corner of the fence, you know. And then she decided the other side of the yard, whatever it is. She came running back to the other side of the yard, stopped halfway, just looked at me. And I said, go ahead. She ran to the other side of the fence. And then she kind of came back. I said, you get it all out? You all good now? You get it all out? She's just standing there. I said, get in the house. She runs back in the house. I close the screen door behind me, go in, lock the door behind me. And I said, go lay down. She went right over, laid right on down the air conditioner vent, just whoop, plopped right down on top of it. Insecurity will get you chasing shadows. You're running from things that aren't chasing you. What you need is the light of God's word to shine into every situation. I may not be good enough in this particular field. I don't know anything about this particular field, but I know God's going to help me. I know my God can strengthen me and give me what I need to get me through that. Serve others out of pure motives. Number six then, remember God made you exactly the way you are. That's why, that's why it's important to worship because worship reminds you of who he is and who you are. Psalm 118 verse six says, the Lord is for me so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All too easily, a person can become a prisoner of the way they see themselves at one particular time in their past. As I head to the conclusion, let me say it, give you four steps then, four steps toward really becoming secure. These are more, almost like stages really than steps, but you'll recognize them. Number one, you have this, you have this bravado of total independence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do things my way. You don't need God and then you realize you do. So then number two, the step is, well, we claim dependence on God. We say we're gonna depend on God. We don't really, because we still try to take things in our own hands, you know? I know when, like, parents are trying to make teenagers act a certain way, and they'll come down and you pray for them with a prayer, but then they go home and they just dog those teenagers, try to manipulate them to act a certain way. I'm like, did we pray or not pray? Do you want God to help, or are you gonna do it? Just the thought. Number three, and this is where everybody gets to at some point, crisis dependence. Now we're talking. You got a crisis when nobody can help you with it, then you go to the Lord. And you're depending on him. You realize you need God. And then number four, which is where I want all of us to end up, and that's how to break off insecurity, which is this total dependence upon the Lord. Total dependence on the Lord. I found this quote by Bob Sorge. is this incredible worship leader who lost his voice is still gone now after all these years. Uh, he was singing praises to God and his voice went out. He only has enough strength in his voice to talk one hour a day. We may have him come preach sometime. You ought to look into some of his books. He's an amazing man of God. And he wrote this, this uh, quote. He says, Time, uh, to when you get into total dependence, time spent with Jesus in prayer is no longer a discipline nor is it merely a delight, but prayer and relationship with God has become for you a matter of sheer survival. When he was trying to figure out his destiny, he's lost his voice, I don't know what's happening, how could I be singing praises to high heaven and, and completely lose my voice and lose all, I mean, just amazing to hear him talk about, it. took him on a study into the life of Job and and he's given uh, the church incredible revelation on Job. But basically what we've learned is when we are weak in our flesh, then he can be strong in us. 
We depend upon God's grace to be strong. Can you say amen? So in many ways, it's like we become like little children. I'm going to ask Morgan and Jordan to come. This, uh, this week, our church had the privilege of, of uh, Michael uh, Linehan and some of his team, some of our interns, uh, took our students to camp. But um, Jordan, uh, this is the uh, Claire and Clint's son, who's uh, North Carolina State, and uh, nearing the end, I think, of, of uh, I'm going to graduate from there soon. But he was in charge of the, the worship band all week at this uh, camp. Four or five hundred kids there from all over the state of North Carolina. And um, Morgan was leading uh, worship this week. And I want her just to take a moment. In fact, why don't you stand just to change your position? They're going to lead us in a song this morning, worship to, to uh, young people. And I believe the Lord's going to break off some insecurity in the room as she sings, but why don't you set up the moment, Morgan, and tell them a little bit about what happened this week. Um, well, on Wednesday night specifically, we were singing this song, Goodness of God, that we're about to sing. Um, it's just really cool to see all the children just worshiping like wholeheartedly. And in that moment, what I really learned was that sometimes we can discount children as not being old enough or like, you know, mature enough or whatever to receive what God has for them to be open. But the thing that I learned was that God sees them and he knows what they're capable of. He knows how they are and he sees all of us just the same. Young or old, doesn't matter how old we are. He's like, I'm gonna speak through you, you know? So that's really, that's definitely something I learned. Let me see something. Yeah, this, this past week was absolutely crazy. Um, specifically uh, on a Wednesday night, um, getting to see kids and third, fourth, and fifth grade, absolutely chasing after the Holy Spirit and um, worshiping with more passion than I've seen some people three or four times their age. Um, it was definitely life-changing, and it, it reminded me of, of the kind of the mantra we have in kids is that there's no Holy Spirit Junior, um, and that the Holy Spirit is for everybody, and uh, the Holy Spirit wants to connect with everyone, and that He's chasing after us, and if we go after Him, um, he'll definitely show up. Goodness of God, oh. 
So I want you just to look at Jordan and Morgan for a second. Do you see, see on their faces a focus on the Lord? Do you see that? They're not drinking in your applause because they know your applause was unto the Lord. To say, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We need a generation like this that gives the glory to the Lord. That isn't, being on the stage is kind of irrelevant but it's to give the glory to God. I mean, both of them talked about seeing those young people with that hunger, you know? That's really what we've been doing around here, is just trying to get ourselves together as a church so that we can have a greater impact on this next generation, on these, on these young ones. Can you say amen? So I need you to be secure in who you are. I need you to be the best you can be on your job. I need you. God needs you to do that. You you are underestimating the impact, the redemptive impact that you stepping into who God's called you to be. Whatever you say, I don't know my job, you don't know. No, every job, every vocational position in our city contributes to elevating the, the light and the glory of God in our city, that people will be drawn to know him. Amen? So God, I pray over your people, those that have just been debilitated by insecurity. I break it off of them. I expose it as the attack of the enemy for what it is in the name of Jesus. And I pray that their um, total confidence in you and trust that you know what you're doing would overwhelm them, would go deep in their spirits in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it. I'm going to ask they bring the lights back up just for a second. I'm going to obey the Lord. It's, this is an awkward part of being a man of the Spirit because I have to obey. I know, I know when the Lord's speaking. And uh, something I, I haven't told you about, we, we came up, uh, by the way, thanks for volunteering on the nursery stuff. Uh, they told me we, we got the volunteers we needed, so thank you for responding. It's great. You guys do so much. We gave uh, um, over $40,000 in, in ministry, um, city ministry and benevolence ministry that we didn't count on. So many people hurting, and, and we did that this year. And now we were going through the numbers recently. We're heading to the end of our year. But, but the, uh, many of the things that you saw us purchase for the kids, the tree and all this, it's all going to go downtown with us. And I really felt the Lord told me to purchase it before we go. We just take it with us and it'll lessen the impact financially there. And so I just, uh, I felt the Lord speak to me about giving an offering to kids today. 
uh, to, to cover all the stuff we've been doing. We're about $40,000 short of where we need to be. I, haven't even, I wasn't even planning on bringing it to you. I, I thought it was just for me, so I gave an amount to the Lord and texted the word kids right behind it, put the amount in there. But then I realized, oh, this is probably... So don't give unless the Lord prompts you to do it. But I'm having the usher's position on the way out too. If you want to write a check, you can give to that. I won't, I won't come back unless, unless I hear from heaven. I won't come back again and ask you on this. But if you feel compelled that you'll give... And the kids offering, you could just type in, you'd type in whatever the amount is and put kids behind it if you're textable giving, or you can write it on the envelope on your way out. Look right up here. I want to give you a a priestly blessing on the way out. Father, I bless your people. I speak faith into them. I speak joy. I do speak increase and fruitfulness. And I pray if there is anyone that came in devastated today by insecurity, that it is broken off of them in Jesus' name, and when they get in their vehicle to go home, that they will sense that today was a different kind of a day in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday, Lord willing. Take care. Bye-bye.